The Time Machine Did It, Chapter 15 Things were looking up for me now. I had five dollars. But I felt I was making money too slowly and painfully, and they hadn't discovered antibiotics yet. This was what gave me my big idea. It occurred to me that the big advantage I had here in the past was that I knew what the future was going to look like. None of these jackasses did. I had been to the future, and even taken a picture of it. I could use that advanced knowledge to make myself rich overnight. All I had to do was pick out something that was common in my time but wasn't available here yet, and then invent it. It would be hard luck on whoever was destined to really invent the thing, but I figured screw him. I got some sheets of writing paper from the lobby in my hotel, then started writing down all the things I'd noticed weren't available in these primitive days. The list was surprisingly long, starting with the ballpoint pen I asked the guy behind the registry desk for. He'd never heard of such a thing, and looked at me like I was a witch. So I settled for a pencil. 1941, I wrote, didn't have ballpoint pens, transistors, long-playing records, TV dinners, electric toothbrushes, push-button telephones, tubeless tires, microwaves, penicillin, VCRs, or almost anything made out of aluminum or plastic. These were still exotic materials in this time period. Practically everything in 1941 was made of iron, wood, glass, or mud. For the next few nights, I worked feverishly, spending all my spare time and all the money I was making on my day jobs, trying to build a high-definition television. Finally, I gave up on that and switched to a ballpoint pen. After my prototype had flown to pieces for the 14th time, embedding the little ball in my cheek for the... Oh, it's blown to pieces. There's a typo here. Had blown to pieces for the 14th time, embedding the little ball in my cheek for the ninth time, I pushed all my inventing equipment out of the window and went out to get drunk. At least I had the skill to do that. I hadn't realized that I never actually had a clue as to how any of the inventions of my era worked. Why hadn't somebody told me I was ignorant? What was the big secret? After I'd had a few beers and had taken out my anger and frustration on some smaller drunks, I started to cheer up again. I realized the mistake I had made was in trying to duplicate the actual important achievements of my time, the things that made life better, the things with moving parts. I could make just as much money, maybe more, by duplicating the crap of my era. So got to work again, trying to cash in, in advance, on some of the nationwide fads that I knew were coming. Davy Crockett hats disco, that sort of thing. But I'll tell you a secret. Most people wouldn't tell you this, but I will. I'm your friend. It's hard to get a nationwide fad going. The nation is a big place. You can get, say, Cincinnati whipped into a frenzy about your product, but just as you're finishing that, now Detroit is starting to calm down, so you have to run back there. The whole thing is harder than it sounds. After two weeks of work, all I had managed to sell were three Davy Crockett caps, two Ralph Crampton bus driver games, and one recording of me singing Stayin' Alive. And the people who bought them weren't very excited about their purchases after a while, and a couple of them wanted to sell them back to me, but I wasn't interested. I'd like to report to you that it wasn't long after this that I figured a way out of my predicament and got back to the good old present day, but it didn't turn out to be that easy. It was eight long months before my chance came to get home. I spent those eight months continuing to earn a small, humiliating living doing day jobs. I never could quite get enough money saved up to get my detective business going, mostly because I kept coming up with brilliant ways to triple my, num my money overnight. I kept thinking I could remember which bum of the month was going to beat Joe Lewis, but it was never any of the guys I put money on. So I had to keep starting over. I pushed mops all over 1941, passed out handbills, posed for before pictures, and so on. My one big payday was a one-day gig I had doing a cameo appearance in the movie The Pride of the Yankees. In the scene where Lou Gehrig finds out he's dying, I'm the guy who's pointing at him and laughing. To save money, I tried living with my grandparents for a while, but they were uncomfortable having me around. I kept hearing them muttering things like, It's not natural. Who is he? And space-time continuum. So after a couple weeks, I split. One money-making idea I had during this period promised to be a gold mine for me. 
I wrote out motion picture scripts that were word-for-word transcriptions of successful films I had seen in the 1990s, then shipped them off to Hollywood and sat back to wait for the checks to come rolling in. All the scripts were returned to me with rejection slips that said they stunk to high heaven. I read the scripts again, and they did. This made me mad on several levels. Despite my shortage of money, life in 1941 wasn't too bad. Like I said before, I'm not a history buff, but the past did have its charms. The food didn't have any preservatives or vitamins in it, so it had a pleasant, dangerous taste that was new to me. There weren't any safety rules anywhere, so if you get hurt yourself, at least you didn't get yelled at, too. And the whole year was in full natural color, not the grainy black and white I was led to expect. I was all kind of It was all kind of pleasant. A restful period in our history to be alive, I felt. It's true that there was a war going on in Europe, but Europe was a long ways away. You couldn't hear any of the screaming where I was. The only time the war entered my life at all in those days was the afternoon I was walking down the street and Rudolf Hess landed on me. I told him he was supposed to land in Scotland, not on top of me, and I expected the Third Reich to replace my hat with just, with one just as good. I hinted that otherwise there would be trouble. Germany was already fighting with France and England. They didn't want to piss me off, too. He tried to surrender to me, but I didn't have any facilities for housing any prisoners at that time. He would have, ha- he would have had to sleep in my bed with me, so I told him he'd better just move along. He wandered off, dragging his parachute behind him, looking back at me like it was a jerk or something. The feeling is mutual, pal. I guess he eventually got to Scotland and lost the war for his country all right. I wasn't the only person who was ignoring the war. Nobody in our town was interested. It was too far away, and no one liked those Europes anyway. The thing the people in our town wanted to talk about, the thing that really got the newspapers excited, was the race for district attorney. This race looked like it was going to be not so much an election, but a coronation for the incumbent, a guy by the name of Mandible, oddly enough. I wondered if he was any relation. He was the most popular man in the city, and everyone from the mayor down was stumping for him. But I wasn't really following the election. I wasn't eligible to vote in this time period anyway, not being alive in any way that could could be measured. Most of my leisure time was spent in bars, where I would regale the locals with my exciting tales of the future. In the future, I informed my slack-jawed audience, there will be gas pumps that talk. What will they talk about? Hushed voices would ask. Gas. This didn't seem so much... This didn't seem so much unbelievable as boring to them. So? asked one of them. So that's something that I know and you don't know. Advantage me. This got them confused. But you just told us all about it, said one. Everybody in the place knows it now, said another. We can't stop thinking about it at this point, added a third. My superior grin faded into an equal scowl. They were right. I vowed not to tell them any more about the future. Why should I give away my advantage? But it's hard not to show off how smart you are. All smart guys know this. After a couple more drinks, I was back to dispensing knowledge again. In the future, I intoned, there will be fins on cars. Then they will be gone. And some day there will be a man named Hitler, or Hister, who will cause a great war. Someone raised their hand. You mean that war that's been going on in Europe for the last two years? Yes, I said impressively. The more I talked about the future, the more interested they got. What's going to happen in 1977? asked one. I forget. How about 1978? Forget. Wait, I think I remember something. No, it's gone. Gee, the future sounds real exciting, one of the drunks sneered. Hey, lay off the future, I warned him. It's all right. Sometimes I got competition from other drunks in the bar who claimed they were from a more interesting future than I was. In the future I'm from, said one drunk in the back, everybody is movie stars, and we're all married to Carol Lombard, and our dogs crap money. I didn't remember any of that, and doubted that this man had ever traveled to the future at all, but he certainly had a more riveting story to tell than I did. After a while I found myself making up stuff too. I didn't feel good about that, but I didn't want to lose my audience. Once you've been the center of attention, it's hard to go back to being one of the guys in the corner. 
Through all of this, I never gave up trying to find a way to get back to 2003. I made it a point to always stand within five feet of anyone I saw carrying a briefcase, just on the off chance he was a time traveler. I haunted briefcase stores. I even listened to the briefcase hour on the radio for a while. But that was a stretch, and the show was pretty terrible, so I switched to Edgar Bergen. Once in desperation, I tried to attract attention to my plight by damaging the space-time continuum, figuring science would eventually trace the problem back to me. So I booed the hell out of Citizen Kane Part 2, the film that focuses on what Kane said after Rosebud. All those long sentences he yelled out real fast at the end there, and that song he sang, trying to make the movie into a flop instead of the biggest blockbuster in film sequel history. I figured future film critics would sense something was wrong, alert the scientific community, and maybe come to my rescue somehow. It flopped all right, thanks to me, but no film critics ever showed up, lazy bastards. But I did finally find a way back home. All I had to do was look across the street at the right moment. I was in the middle of one of my humiliating day jobs, pigeon-cleaning duty for the city. I especially hated brushing their filthy little teeth and combing their ratty fur. And where were their wings? That's what I wanted to know. When I looked up at the right moment, to, when I looked up at the right moment to see an elevator suddenly appear on the sidewalk and Big Al Pellagra get out and start walking purposefully across the street. Under his arm was a figurine of justice holding the scales.